Good evening, and uh, thank you for uh, joining this evening. Um, on behalf of Orthopedic Associates and the Spine Institute, um, I'm Dr. William Barrick. Um, I'm the senior partner and president of the group right now. Um, my background is um, I basically I went to medical school in Rutgers, uh, New Jersey, America's Medical School, graduated in 1990. I did my orthopedic training, which was a five-year residency at Tufts New England Medical Center in Boston. And I did a spine fellowship with Dr. Arthur White, who was a president in the North American Spine Society, and he founded one of the first spine institutes in the U.S., which was the San Francisco Spine Institute, and I completed my fellowship in 1995. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to give a presentation. Um, it's about 30 minutes, and then afterwards what we're going to do is we're going to allow time for questions. So I would ask that if you have any questions or comments that we just wait until the end, and I'll try to give everybody a chance to get in uh, some comments. We'll probably do about 30 minutes of uh, questions. So. Um, I'm going to have David, with me is David Brooke, who is our marketing director, and he's going to run the slideshow. Uh, I have to uh, apologize if I'm not, uh, this is my first webinar. This is kind of like new technology to me. I'm one of the old guys, so uh, hopefully this will go well for us. So we'll get started. So basically, uh, the purpose of this talk and the goals tonight should be to tell you what are the most common causes of neck pain and back pain. And basically, whatever I apply to the lower back it applies to the neck problem because a lot of the same things happen. They're just two other areas of the spine. Um, so uh, I'm with the Spine Institute, which is part of Orthopedic Associates. We are the only multidisciplinary spine center with all different specialists in one building. We have um, rehabilitation doctors, pain management doctors, and nurse practitioners. We have a neurologist that does our neurological testing. And then we have three board certified orthopedic spine surgeons, uh, myself, my partner is Dr. Perkins, and Dr. Rinaldo. Um, and uh, we have a very busy practice. We probably, as, as surgeons, we probably do each over 200 surgeries a year. So our, our facility probably does, our, our spine institute probably does over um, six to 700 spinal surgeries a year. And we do everything from same day surgery, uh, where we basically come in and like a little one inch incision, walk out the same day at our surgery center at Orthopedic Associates to major reconstructive surgeries. I, I do complex spinal surgery. We do scoliosis, we do trauma, I do um, tumor surgery. So pretty much we do everything. There's very few cases that we have to refer out to other places. Um, and uh, we all have extensive training in this. So we'll start with the first slide. So usually the first question patients ask when they come to the office, is what, what's, what's causing my back pain? What's causing my neck pain? And I'll go through the different causes of pain first, and then we'll talk about how we evaluate a patient, how we order tests, what treatments there are, when surgery is necessary, if surgery is necessary. Um, so about 90% of people, back pain is due to a, what's called degenerative conditions. And that's a condition called degenerative disease. In layman's terms, the, the confusing thing about spine, there's a lot of different names for the same thing. So this is also known as bulging discs. Now, sometimes what happens is the discs start to lose water, and I'll have some photographs to go through that. And then what happens is, as the discs lose water, the spine shifts back and forth, and it causes bone spurs to form. So when you have an x-ray, you see narrowing of the disc, or on an MRI, you see the disc losing water. That's called degenerative disc disease. And then later in life, as you get older and the spine wears out, you get bone spurs on the x-rays. And sometimes the discs collapse till they're bone on bone. And then what happens is you form bone spurs. Once you see bone spurs on an x-ray, this condition turns into a condition called spondylosis, also known as osteoarthritis. Now, what is a herniated disc or spinal stenosis? These are complications of these two conditions. The degenerative disc disease is, is usually in anywhere from teenage years to young to mid adulthood. So sometimes when the disc is wearing out, you get a tear in the disc and a piece of the disc comes out and hits the nerve. That's called a herniated disc. And I'll show you some pictures on that later. So herniated discs um, really, if it's in the neck, it causes pain down the arm, and if it's in the lower back, it causes pain in the buttock, sciatica, in the hips, legs, or thighs. So herniated discs do not cause back or neck pain. It's very important you understand that. And then if it, it, later on in life, when you get the arthritis, if bone screws grow from the back of the canal and pinch the nerve, then that's called spinal stenosis. So discs, if you draw a picture here, this is a disc, a bulging disc. If a piece comes out, that's called a herniated disc from the back. Now, in the back here, we have these joints called facet joints. And sometimes as you get older, these joints get bigger and they pitch the nerve from the back. So spinal stenosis is from the back, herniated disc is from the front. And some people have both. And a lot of those people end up having surgery because they just, they're really bad. Now, when you have herniated disc and spinal stenosis, when you get numbness, tingling, weakness, 
Some people it affects the, the nerves that control the circulation rarely. That's a sign that the nerve is pinched, either from a herniated disc, which is a soft thing that comes through here, or a bone spur or a ligament that comes from the back. So 70% so of degenerative discs, it used to be think when I was in training years ago, well, bulging your discs are due to car accidents and injuries and just old age and you know, um, you know, being heavy or your bed or your legs being long or the wrong shoes. That's all been disproven. We know for a fact degenerative disc disease should really be called genetic disease. It's 70% purely due to genetics. And it's basically due to the collagen which is the protein in the disc. And basically genetics determines how quickly your discs wear out. Some people just are born to have their discs wear out right away. We have family histories where multiple family members have back problems and degeneration. And we, we've proved this. It, it, they did a study of identical twins in Norway, a thousand pairs of identical twins. In the Scandinavian countries, they have national health care. So everybody, they have everybody's medical records. And they did a study of identical twins and they found that 70% of the time regardless of whether one smoked, regardless of whether one was heavy, regardless of whether one had a work injury or an accident, their MRIs were identical. So from that, we, we discovered that this is primarily genetic. So the good thing about knowing it's genetic is you don't have to be worried all the time. You know, it's people like, well, if I do this, this will happen. Yes, but the, the bottom line is you don't, because it's a genetic condition, it doesn't matter what you do. You know, you're either going to have problems, or you're not going to have problems. Now, 30% of this is environmental. And this is the stuff that everybody thinks causes back problems, which does contribute. The number one most preventable thing is smoking and nicotine. It damages the blood supply to the disc. And, and if you want to do one thing to try to prevent your back from hurting forever is if you're a smoker or you're a vapor of nicotine, you got to stop doing it. And there's lots of help out there, which I'm not going to go to. But people who smoke in nicotine always have more back problems than people who don't. And then when you have surgery, there's a lot of complications from this wound healing problems. The bones don't heal together. And it's, it's, it's uh, you know, infections. Now, trauma. Now, now that, that's not to be said you can't, you can have a back injury. Most people have degenerative disease, don't know it. Most people, when the discs are wearing out, have no symptoms. And then something happens, sometimes a car accident or work injury can trigger it to be symptomatic. But if you do have a car accident, if you do have a work injury, and you see a bulging or herniated disc, I promise you that disc was present prior to the accident. It just wasn't bothering you. So we think of injuries as triggering events. And that's how it works out. So it's still, it's still covered by comp and no fault. But, but, but normal discs are almost impossible to injure. Normal discs are, are like a hockey puck. So the force that it would take to injure, take a totally normal disc and tear it or, or cause a herniation is like, it's like trying to injure a hockey puck. The bone would break first. So it's almost impossible to injure a normal disc. So if you injure a disc, that disc was starting to wear out anyway. Um, the other things are body mechanics. If you bend and twist improperly, you put more stress on the spine. So that's why they say bend at the hips and knees and turn using your feet, not twisting through your waist. Same thing with the neck. You, want to, you, you don't want to do a lot of bending and twisting through the neck. You want to keep your neck in a comfortable position. Obesity or weight. I tell people, if you have a back problem, it's harder to recover if you're carrying more weight. But the weight itself doesn't cause the problem. Next slide. All right, so this starts early in the teens. And this is just a diagram. These are, yeah, thank you, David. These are normal discs. They're like a shock absorber. They're tall. They're nice and tight here. And then the first thing that happens is you start to get little tear, the, the proteins in the disc wear out and the disc starts to lose water. So when the disc starts to lose water, the disc starts bulging out like a tire. It's like a shock absorber tire without enough air. And when that disc bulges, the spine gets loose and starts to shift back and forth. And that shifting does two things. One, it causes little tears in the disc called annular tears. And then what happens is as the tears happen, the disc material starts to come out here the other thing that happens that they're not showing here is there's a ligament here. And when the disc is not tense like this, the ligament tends to shift back and forth and buckles in. And from the constant shifting back and forth, it causes the spinal stenosis and arthritis. These are called facetuants. So then later on in life, as it goes on, you end up like this where the disc is collapsed. You've got a lot of bone spurs and you've got these thickened ligaments. And that's when, that's when the nerve gets pinched by bone spurs. And that's called spinal stenosis. Whereas younger in the process, when you're younger, when the disc is just starting to wear out and you get a tear in the disc and blow it out, that's a herniated disc. So that's spinal stenosis and that's herniated disc. And that's leg pain, arm pain versus back pain. If this is just happening and the disc isn't pinched, then you, mostly you just have episodes where your back seizes up. And it's due to a collagen 10 defect. Sometimes the discs are malformed at birth and you get these bones that look like they're wedged in a row and they get, you get these squiggly discs like that. And that's a condition called Showerman's. 
and that's associated with back pain as a teenager. It kind of tends to get better on its own. 90% of pain is degenerative or genetic, and those usually, you know, are treated non-surgically. Now, 5% of the time you can have fractures, and if you get in a bad car accident, you fall off a building, you have severe pain. When they take you to the hospital, the first thing they do is a CT scan to make sure you don't have a broken bone. And some people, if the bone is broken and it's really unstable, you have to do surgery right away. Some fractures, the bone's not too badly broken, you can treat in a brace for six weeks. But there are other people whose bones just break without a significant amount of force. And those are usually people that have cancer in the bone, or very commonly, we see older people get osteoporosis, and their bones get so thin because as you get older, you lose bone density, especially in women after you get your ovaries removed or you go through menopause. And sometimes the bone, literally these women are just lifting a window, and their, their spine cracks on its own. So 5% is fractures. And then other bad stuff that people worry about, tumors, 2% of people have benign tumors, uh, they're pretty rare. They're usually more common in teenagers or kids. Malignant primary tumors of the spine are extremely uh, rare, like like one in you know like zero point one percent. And then the most common tumors we see are people that have cancer elsewhere that spreads to the spine, and that's metastatic. But normally, almost everybody that has that has a history of cancer. Rarely, I'll have somebody to come into the office and I'll be the first one to diagnose cancer. But most of these are in people that already have breast cancer or prostate or other things. But they're fairly uncommon. So if you come in with back pain, the chance of you having a tumor is like 2% or less. Now, there are other groups, people who are immunosuppressed, people who have, you know, are sick, they have diabetes, really bad diabetes, they are on dialysis, people on renal dialysis, you know, don't fight infections, people that put you know, um, IV drugs in, and it's not really the needles, it's actually the drugs that are dirty. Uh, and people who have blood infections elsewhere can sometimes get an infection in the disc space or the vertebral body. In rare cases, in other countries, people get tuberculosis, but we almost never seen that day. But that's about 2% of people. Now, how do you tell people who have normal back pain from tumors or infections? Well, we have these called red flags. If you have a tumor or infection in your spine, the pain isn't gonna come and go and it's not really gonna be mostly activity related, like when you get up and bend and twist. People with tumors infections, they have rapidly progressive pain, doesn't matter what they do, it's even worse when they lie down. So when they have rapidly progressive pain, not pain that comes and goes, pain at night, primarily night, pain worse when they left, then you worry about tumors and infections. So uh, we'll go clear, and then we'll go next slide. Um, other causes, now, a lot of people say, well, I have back pain because I have scoliosis. Usually not. Scoliosis is usually painless, unless it gets really bad, like a tilt of, like most people, scoliosis is like 10 degrees, and that's not bad. But if it gets around 40 degrees, which is where we have to do surgery or brace, then sometimes it causes abnormal loading in the spine and sometimes causes back pain. But when I see a teenager with scoliosis and they have back pain, I'm looking for something else, and that's usually degenerative disc disease. And scoliosis is genetic. So scoliosis itself doesn't usually cause back pain. Other things, kyphosis, some people have a hunchback, and the most common cause of that is some wedge vertebra, and that's a condition called Showerman's that we talked about. And that gets mistaken for fractures all the time. So some people get in an accident, they say, oh my God, you have multiple fractures in your back, but yeah, I'm not in that much pain, I feel fine. That's usually this condition called Showerman's, and I apologize for my handwriting. Uh, and then there's another condition sometimes where you get a crack in the bone, or as, or as the, the, the disc lose water, the bone slips forward, and that's called the spondylolisthesis. But all of these things just are 5% of pain. And then one thing that's not related to the spine itself that causes pain is pain in the sacroiliac joint. And that's pain that goes in, in, in where the, the spine connects to the pelvis. But we're gonna, we're gonna focus on, on the other back pain right now. Okay, next slide. So what are red flags? In 1994, the United States and UK Public Health Services said, you know, we got all these people with severe back pain. If we get an MRI on everybody, we're gonna use the entire national health budget on, on MRI. So people are like, oh, I have severe pain, I have to have an MRI. And all my friends said I have an MRI. And they found out about 95% of these people that got an MRI real quick with severe back pain either had a normal MRI or they just had a bulging, a torn disc. So they said, well, how do we, how do we separate the, the, the vast majority of people with benign back pain from real back pain? And that's where they came up with these guidelines. So you don't need, it, even if you're in severe pain, as long as you're not very young or very old, as long as you don't have diabetes with fevers, cancer, a major trauma, and that's not like bending over to pick up something at work. That's like lifting something really heavy and you feel a pop or you fall off a building or something falls on you or a car accident. 
people who are immunocompromised, people who are on steroids, people with lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes those medicines can cause, you know, to, to allow an infection of the spine. IV drug abusers, people on kidney, you know, a lot of those people have spine infections. So if you have these risk factors and severe pain, then the doctor may order an MRI right away. But if you don't have these risk factors, usually we don't order an MRI for six weeks. The other features, these people say pain with rest. If, you're, if you have back pain, you also feel very sick, fever, chills, very weak, unexplained weight loss, pain that's worse with rest, pain that wakes you up all the time from a sound sleep. It's rapidly worsening despite medications. If you suddenly get weakness or inability to walk, sudden loss of bowel or bladder control, so if you get sudden nerve damage, you know, from a large herniated disc or something, that's another reason. But most back, most back pain gets better without doing an MRI and just gets better with usual care. So next slide. All right, so let's talk about spinal anatomy. So the 33 vertebra, and if you look, the spine has three natural curves. This is called, a, a, so we're looking at somebody from the side. This is called the lordosis, and then the middle back has a hunch a little bit. And the lower back goes like this. So don't ask me why, but just those curves are needed to balance out the muscles in the spine and help you stand straight. So when you lose that normal curvature and you're like this or you're like this or bent over, that can cause strain on the muscles. So then you have these vertebral bodies. This part's called the pedicle that connects to the front from the back. This is the spinal canal. And then the discs connect the two bones. So they're a ligament. And then you have these things called the facet joints or the superarticular processes, and these kind of interlock like shingles. So what happens is each, each level, each motion segment is a disc combined with two facet joints and plus all these other ligaments. There's ligaments here. So when there's a problem with either the disc or the ligaments or the facet joints, that's where you get problems where the nerves can get pinched. Okay, so this is the hole where the nerve... Now I see a lot of people in my practice where this hole is, is smaller because this part is short. Some people are born with really short pedicles and they have, so their spine starts out like this. And a lot of those people are susceptible later in life to problems. And that's called congenital, sorry, spinal stenosis. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the spine is, decide, is designed to move yet preserve the spine. And you can see this is a neck model. The neck's a little different because the neck at the top, there's no disc. The skull on C1, which is most of your up-down motion of your head, 50% of that motion is there's no disc there, although sometimes you can get arthritis rarely. This here is, is C1, C2. And what it is, is this allows your head to turn. So it's like, it's got a peg like this, C2, and then C1 is here and there's ligaments and that allows your head to turn. And also there's no disc here. So even if your whole neck is fused by arthritis or surgery, you're still gonna have at least 50% of your motion. But it's the disc down here, and these bones are numbered, they're numbered. This is C2, first neck, three, C4, C5. There's seven bones in your neck. And so when we're talking about a C3, four problem, it's the disc or the bone spur between those levels. Uh, likewise, the lumbar spine is L1, two, three, four, and five. And then this is S1. And so we say if you have an L4, five disc, that means there's a disc that's herniated there. Now the thoracic spine is different. Let me just clear that. So the thoracic spine, because it's got ribs on it, doesn't move as much as the other spine. Most of your motion's here and here. So when the discs are wearing out and there's more stress and motion here, that's why more people have neck problems and lower back problems. Whereas the thoracic spine has ribs. So we, we do have C herniated discs in there and other problems and degeneration, but it's much more rarely because the ribs, there's very little motion in the thoracic spine. So that's why problems are less common there. Okay, so next slide. Now, um, just uh, want to clear that. So just to look at uh, the structure of the disc, a normal disc looks like an Oreo cookie. It's got this very well-defined outside called the annulus fibrosis. The annulus, that means, that's the Latin word that means ring. And that connects the two bones together and allows you to bend and twist and give it support. And then the inside is like a jelly or a shock absorber. And that's called the nucleus pulposus. So when you see the term HNP in a report, that stands for herniated nucleus pulposus. So what that means is when the discs start to lose water in here first, then you get little tears in the disc and the disc material gets pushed out here because the little tears in here can't hold it. And then eventually if one of those tears completes itself, you, you may get what's called an annular tear. There's a tear, these are little tears and the discs come out like this. And then sometimes when one of those pieces of disc makes itself to the surface, then it's called a herniated disc. So normal disc, degenerative or bulging disc. So it's like a with tire without enough air. This is a nice full tire and then herniated disc, okay? 
So next slide. So when we, we, we come to the doctor's office, we take a history. When did the pain start? Is it burning? That's nerve pain, sharp, dull. How bad is it on a zero to 10? Because if the pain's a 10, you know, we might have to do things sooner rather than later, whereas the pain's a two. Does the pain go into the arm or leg? Is there numbness, tingling, or weakness? If you're losing bowel or bladder control, that's really bad. That means the spinal cord's cut off. Does your family have back problems? Do you smoke? And if you injured, you know, if it's a work comp or a no fault injury, and then if you had any previous injuries, you know, then we have to tell those about. It. Then we examine you. We, we normally we only get X-rays if you're like a 25 year old person with back pain for two weeks or a couple of days, unless there's something really bad on exam. We usually don't do X-rays initially, but if if you're old, you have osteoporosis, you have cancer, uh, you had a bad car accident, then we would get X-rays initially. And the younger people will just watch them for a few weeks. If they're not better, then we get X-rays. Now. If, if we're suspecting somebody has infection or cancer, then we could do blood tests for infection and cancer, screening test. Now, when you do an MRI, if there's no red flags and those are those serious conditions we talked about, basically just about everybody, as long as you don't have severe nerve damage, we try non-surgical treatment for six weeks because the rationale is, well, most people get better without surgery. And usually we only need an MRI if you're gonna do surgery. Otherwise you do an MRI if you're gonna get better anyway, why spend the $1,200 on an MRI? So, and, and this is basically, this isn't just my opinion. These are guidelines, national guidelines. And we know not everybody needs an MRI because in Canada where they only have so many MRIs, it takes six months to get an MRI in Canada. They don't have worse outcomes from back problems in the US. In fact, some, some studies show that if you get an MRI early on someone with a workman's comp case and they're told they have bulging discs, they're gonna be afraid to go back to work. So sometimes it's better not to know. Uh, if people have numbness and tingling for more than six weeks, then we could do a nerve test to see where the pitch nerve is and also to make sure you don't have a condition called neuropathy. Sometimes a nerve can get pinched in your arm, that's carpal tunnel syndrome, or in your elbow, that's called cubital tunnel syndrome. Sometimes people can get pinched nerves in the leg. And then CT scan, that's what you normally get in the emergency room for a fracture. And that looks at the bones, but it really doesn't look at the disc. So most of the time, we only do CTs in, in a trauma situation in the hospital or for people who can't have an MRI, like with a pacemaker. So this is an MRI of, uh, and what we're doing is you're looking at from the feet up. So pretend you're looking at somebody from their feet, looking up, lying on their back. So this is the front, this is the back, this is the left side, right side. So this is the, basically this is um, called the aorta here, and this is splitting into the vessels. This is your vena cava. These are your muscles, psoas muscles that bend your hip. These are your belly contents. So this is a normal disc. It's got lots of water. Water is white on an MRI. And then this is the spinal canal. And you can see this is a nerve coming out. And then this is this, those shingle joints, the facet joints that overlap. And they're fairly normal facet joints. And you can see this black stuff here is cartilage. So they have cartilage just like a knee or a hip. And this is cartilage, but it's different than knee or hip. So this is nice and normal. This is called the ligament of flavum. Okay, and that, that's normally allowed, connects the bones. It's very flexible but later on in life it gets thickened and sometimes can pinch in there. So you can see the nerves are getting through, no pinching. Now this is a bulging disc or degenerative disease. You can see you, you, don't, you lose the Oreo cookie appearance. So you lose the water in the disc. You see a little bit of water here and then you see these little white lines here, which are little tears in the disc. And what happens is when the disc loses water, it bulges out and pushes. You can see it starts to pinch the nerves a little bit. And then you can see when the disc wears out and shifts, these joints get a little bit enlarged. They start getting some arthritis. And, that, and, and then you can see the nerves start to get pinched. And then later on, when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, sometimes in the, it, it, you never see a normal disc herniate. You never see it. Always when you see a herniated disc, that disc was kind of wearing out like a tire or a shock. And then the herniated disc is where one of these little tears completes itself and it, and it comes out and pinches the nerve. And also then you have leg pain, then you have sciatica. And um, usually most people, 60% of people have no idea why it herniated. Other 40% of people, oh yeah, I was bending, twisting, I was doing something at work and it popped. But the fact that 60% of people don't recall what happened means sometimes it just happens on its own. Maybe just from turning in bed at night, you know, the wrong way. So this is an example of spinal stenosis. Now, this is a, a fairly normal segment. You can see that this is like an Oreo cookie. Now this, this is degenerative, but you don't see all the water in it. And there's a little bit of thickening of these ligaments. These are called the ligament of flavum, and a little bit of arthritis. But you can see the little nerves are getting through. Now this is a person who has a short, congenital spinal stenosis, they have short pedicles. And you can see their disc, they don't have a herniated disc. The disc is flattened and bulging, but really the problem is this ligament from shifting back and forth over the years gets really thickened. And you can see these little, these joints get really thickened from bone spurs. 
So these are bone spurs of ligament. You can see the nerves are all crowded in. And that usually happens over time. That happens when you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s. So a lot of older people have this, whereas younger people have the herniated disc. Now, what are the treatments? So pretty much 80% of people get better without surgery. 80% of people get better with surgery. So if there's no risk and there's no pain, why not do non-surgery? So 80% of our patients are treated successfully not surgery. So what we do is we do physical therapy. Now, sometimes if you're in a lot of pain, you can't move. It's hard to do the exercises. So the first thing they'll do is they'll do some heat, usually in the morning when the back is stiff, ice when the back is swollen or after activity, massage, ultrasound. This is called the TENS unit. This is like a thing that puts an electrical signal on and blocks the pain. Then when you start to loosen up with the pain, we start people doing active exercises. And mostly that's not stretching. You want to do strengthening, not stretching, because stretching puts more stress on the discs and the bones. What you want to do is learn how to do things and strengthen the muscles to support the spine so you don't put stress on the discs. So we do something called stabilization. And you can look this up. There's lots of exercises on YouTube. It's called core stabilization. So you're building up your muscles. And then as pain control goes, basically we, we use what's called multimodal pain management. And back in the 80s, the, the government and patient advocacy groups decided, well, you know, everybody has a right to 100% pain relief. So they said, well, we have to do this. So we were get, as doctors, we were getting punished if people didn't have 100% pain relief. And um, what happens is uh, people, we were, you know, doctors didn't know what else to do. Well, we're going to get in trouble if the patients don't have pain relief. And everybody that comes to the doctors already tried Tylenol and Advil and Motrin. So they said, well, we have to do, you know, give something. So we started giving people opioids. And then the pharmaceutical company said, well, we got this stuff out that, you know, is not as addicting because it doesn't make you high. It's slow release. But then as people do, some people started breaking up the pills and abusing the drugs. And pretty soon we had all these drug addicts. So a lot of that was pushed by um, actually the government, the um, what's called JCO, the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals. They came up with this idea in 1998 that said pain is the fifth vital sign and nobody's allowed to be in pain. So that's how we got the drug crisis. So the pendulum has now swung the other way and now like opioids are bad. I think the proper thing to do is somewhere in the middle. So what we do is, first thing we do is we don't try to do drugs. We try to do ice, heat, massage, pain creams, lotions, lidoderm patches are over the counter now. You can get, I personally like icy hot patches. We have non-invasive laser, which I'll talk about. And sometimes if the spine's shifting or there's a lot of spasm, you can go in a brace temporarily. And then what we do is we say, is my pain less than a, let me just clear this for a sec. Is my pain, the goal is to get the pain less than a five on a zero to 10 scale. So anybody can live with pain less than a five. It's zero pain is hard to achieve, but most people can deal with pain over five. They can work, they can do what they have to do. So we do is we say, if your pain's over a five, then do this. Is your pain less than a five? Yes, it's less than stop. If it's not, you build, instead of going from one thing to another to another, you keep adding things on to attack pain from different directions. So the next thing we do is acetaminophen. I personally like the extended release Tylenol because it lasts longer. And basically you can take up to six pills a day. If you take too much, you can damage your liver. So reassess, is the pain less than a five? Yes, it is, okay, stop. If it's not, then you can take an anti-inflammatory unless you're on blood thinners. But a lot of people take this like candy. They, they take 10 of these, 10 of these, you only want to take one medicine in this class because it can cause GI bleeding. And it's not the best medicine for long-term use if you have heart problems or liver problems so and, or kidney problems. So you got to be careful with these. That's why they're the third line agent. Now, let's say it's not back pain, but you got pain going down your leg or arm and it's burning type pain. Pain from a herniated disc spondylosis. These medicines don't do a lot for that, but the best medicines are nerve pain medicines. And these are anti-seizure drugs, gabapentin, pregabalin, also known as Lyrica. And what, the way they work is they slow down nerve irritability. They make the nerves less irritable. They don't really work for back pain, but they work for sciatica and pain that shoots down the arm. So we take all of these together. And then only the fifth line, only if, you know, and this is for short term. I never give these medicines for more than seven to 10 days. It's things like muscle relaxers, if you're having spasms, and very judicious use of opioids. I tell people, use these medicines like a fire extinguisher. In other words, you do not take the amount I prescribe, just take them if the pain is so bad that none of this is working and you're otherwise gonna to go to the emergency room. So use these medicines very rarely as a fire extinguisher and there's less of a chance of getting addicted. 
Now, the, the next option we have is, let's say, all right, I do ther physical therapy. I take the meds. It's weeks later. I'm not better. Doc, I, I just can't tolerate the therapy. I'm not getting better. Well, all right, we can put needles in your back and do injections. Well, Doc, I don't like needles. Needles are painful and needles are scary. Well, we could do surgery. Oh, no, I don't want surgery. Surgery's bad. My friends and my neighbors all tell me um, surgery's bad. So we, we came up with something laser, and this is completely painless, non-invasive, drug-free, and we found that Basically, 70% of our patients, when we went and looked back that had this, um, said that it was worth the money to pay. Now, it is, it is approved by the FDA. So in other words, it's been proved to be effective and safe. But the problem is because it's new technology, a lot of the insurance companies haven't caught on yet. So Medicare, Medicaid, none of the private insurers cover it. But it's starting to get covered. We're seeing some people with no-fault car accidents and some people with workman's comp are actually getting coverage for this. So if you want to know, well, what have I not tried yet? What's new? This is the new thing and it's very popular. Basically, the, the, the treatments take seven minutes. They're done right in the office by the medical assistant. You have to wear glasses to protect your eyes because you don't want to get a laser beam in your eyes. And the way it works is it starts to do two things. One is it increases blood flow to the area to help repair the tissue while the other laser beam decreases inflammation. And normally for acute pain is less than six weeks. We recommend six to eight sessions. It's, it takes, you have to build it up. And then if it's greater than uh, six weeks, that's chronic pain, we recommend eight to 10 sessions. And this can be done virtually anywhere, neck, mid back, lower back, hip, knee, ankle, foot. We can even do it on people that just had surgery to help with post-operative pain relief. My partners are using them on total knees and hips. And as long as the wound's healed, it doesn't seem to cause any problems. So that's, that's the coolest thing we have now. And to be honest with you, when, I, when we decided to get this, I was very skeptical. You know, I was like, ah, this is, this is like, you know, snake oil. This is just some way people are trying to make money. But actually, some of my patients were pretty happy with it. And, and one of the guys that I work with that uh, brings the spine and crypt and I do this use surgery, he, you know, he, um, he swears by this. He's been using this for years. So it, if you don't want surgery, you don't want injections, this is the way to go. Um, now, the next thing is, let's say you try the laser, or let's say I don't want to pay the money for the laser, and you still have pain that's really bad. Then you could do interventional pain management. And that consists of coming into the surgery center, bringing an x-ray machine in, and then we inject cortisone and local medicine into the painful areas. But it's very important. I have, uh, I have sometimes had people come in, and they have severe nerve damage and severe cord impingement. They say, no, I don't want surgery. If you have nerve damage, and if your spinal cord and nerve is severely pinched, if you try to do this injection, you could cause permanent damage. So only these are only an options if there's no damage and the nerve compression is mild to moderate, which means you have numbness or tingling that comes and goes. If you have a severe weakness on examination, if the leg is completely numb, you cannot do these injections. You've got to go to surgery. And the indication or necessity for this is LPT meds, brace laser after six weeks or sooner. Let's say you just can't tolerate therapy. Then, then sometimes we can do the injection, then send you back to therapy. So sometimes it's not all or one. Sometimes we mix different treatments together. It's like making, a, it's like working in a kitchen, making a recipe. Sometimes not everything works for one person. You got to try different things. Now, if we're going to do an injection, it's a good idea to get an MRI first because you don't want to be sticking needles in and realize, oh my God, you know, I've been just covering up for a tumor infection. So normally my policy is to never to do an uh, injection to the spine without having an MRI first. Uh, so the, the, first time the first type of injection are epidural injections, and they're really for leg pain or arm pain. Some people use them for back pain, but they're usually, and what epidural means, epi means around dura. Dura is the nerve sac, and what happens is you go in under x-ray guidance, and if this is the nerve sac and the nerves are inside, you, know, there, you can go from the back here, there's a ligament. What you do is you put a needle in, sometimes there's fluid in the needle, and when the needle gets through the ligament, the fluid pushes the nerves away, because so, you don't want to go into the nerve. And then you put the medicine around the nerve, and it's supposed to soothe the nerve. Now, sometimes we do it in the middle. Uh, approach I like to use is down here. There's a little hole. You can do it with a really little needle, and there's less chance of hitting all the major nerves. And then you shoot the medicine up. Sometimes if the disc is out here, and this is called, this is called transforaminal, okay? These here are called translamina because you're doing it through the lamina. And then sometimes if this is out here, we can go in with a needle and sneak around here to do that. And that's also another type of transraminal. So these are done mostly for people with sciatica, arm pain. 70% of people get relief for three months. But I tell people, if you want to do epidurals, fine. Do one or two. There's no benefit to doing a third. They used to do them as a third. 
But if you're not better and you don't stay better after two injections, you should think about going, you should, you need to see a spine surgeon to make sure you don't need something with surgery, even if you don't want surgery. Um, but if you just keep injecting epidurals, I've had people like 30 epidurals, it's really bad for you. Steroids have a lot of bad side effects. And sometimes with, with chronic injections, sometimes if, if the steroids get into the nerves, they can cause permanent nerve damage. So there is a little risk with these. There's a, you know, about, about one in a thousand people can get nerve damage from these or a spinal headache or something else like that. So they do have some risks. They're usually not too painful. We usually use them under local anesthetic uh, because we want to make sure we're not getting too close to the nerve. Uh, and uh, some people are really anxious. They can do light sedation. So then um, if, you, if you don't have arm or leg pain, the pain is in your back itself, we could do something called facet blocks. And the facets are those, remember those shingles that we talked about? So sometimes you inject the nerve around the shingle and it can help. Now the problem is facets cause about 40% of the pain. So if the pain's coming from the disc, these may not work. But if they do work, there's something called radio frequency where we can basically take away the feeling in that arthritic joint. And about 60 to 70% of people get relief for a year. Then there's another kind of injection, pain lower down, that's below where the waist is. And it kind of goes into the back and the hip. And it's worse when you turn your leg in and out. And that's the sacral act joint. And sometimes we can do it, uh, blocks or ablation for those. And those are for people that are, you know, really not, not the, the regular stuff's not working. So sometimes people either aren't candidates for surgery, or let's say they have surgery and surgery didn't work. The nerve damage was too severe. They have too much scar tissue. And people with really intractable, disabling pain, medicines, nothing helps. The last option we do is something called neuromodulation. And that's where they go in and put in the spinal canal, they'll, if your pain or problems here, they go higher up near the end of the spinal cord and they feed a catheter in. And what they do is temporarily they put a battery and the battery creates a buzzing sense signal. And so the pain signals are going, this blocks the pain signal. And what they usually do is they do a trial first for a week. And if you say this relieves my pain, then they can implant a permanent device that has a battery that you can recharge. So it's usually seen in failed surgery if you don't get better, or let's say this person's too high of a risk for surgery that's sometimes we put in. And our, my partners do the trials and then we have some local surgeons that do the implants. I personally don't do the stimulators, but we have a referral network of people who do them. So when is surgery necessary? Okay, and that, this is the biggest question everybody has. And there are only a few situations where a surgeon will come and I'll tell a person, listen, you don't have a choice, you have to have surgery. And people say, oh no, I want a second opinion. My friends say don't have surgery. That's elective surgery. If you don't have nerve damage, if your spine is stable, you just have back pain and some leg pain, yes, you can get a second opinion, go home and think about it, you can get set. But, but if a surgeon comes in and says, this is an emergency, that means if you don't have surgery within 24 to 40 hours, you're gonna have permanent problems, paralysis, chronic pain, you're gonna be a mess. So when is surgery necessary? If you have what's called an unstable spine fracture due to severe trauma. So if you have an accident and your spine is dislocated, or, or it's burst into the canal, or you're bent over because the bone's fractured, you know, if the spine is really deformed. Now, if you just have a, a little compression fracture, that's treated in a brace, so you don't need surgery for that. And then sometimes if you have a fracture called a burst fracture, where the bone kind of gets crushed out like this, not all of those need surgery. Some of those can be treated in a brace, but if you have this and there's nerve damage, then you need surgery. So if you're on a car accident and your spine's broken, you need surgery. It's not time to say, oh, you know, I guess you, I don't want to, I got a second opinion. The other time we need emergency surgery is sometimes you get spinal cord damage. You get either a tumor that grows into the spinal cord. Sometimes you get pus and infection in there from those people who do IV drugs or diabetics or people with blood infections. If there's pus in the spinal canal or tumor, you got to do surgery right away. Sometimes you can, in rare cases, you can get a large herniated disc or bad spinal stenosis and the person just can't move their leg. If you have severe weakness, severe numbness, you can't walk, you can't move, you need surgery right away. Now there's, a, there's something called cauticoinus syndrome. So below the spinal cord in the lower back, the nerves come out like this. And somebody back in the old days would say, well, it looks like a horse's tail. So cauda means tail, a quina, a tail of the horse. Now, sometimes when you get a massive herniated disc below the spinal cord, you'll have both legs will get numb. You'll, you'll, you, you won't be able to feel your butt neck area, and you could be losing bowel clotter control. If both legs are painful, weak, and numb, you can't walk, you're losing control about it, and there's a massive disc herniation, you've got 48 hours to get that out or else it'll be permanent. We used to think we had six hours, and we'd do surgery in the middle of the night, 
and nobody likes to do surgery in the middle of the night. Everybody's tired. So we found out through studies, maybe it's better to wait till the next day when you got a fresh team. And they said, and by waiting the next day, it was okay. You got 48 hours to get better. So if, I, so if somebody tells you you have quadriquinus syndrome, if you have an unstable fracture or spinal cord compression with severe nerve damage, you need surgery right away. Don't, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Next slide. Now, let's say you don't have those conditions. You have the herniated disc, you have spinal stenosis, you have pain in your arm and leg, there's some numbness and thing that we just go, when, doc, when do I do surgery? We, we have the answers. There's very good studies that show when you should have surgery. Multi-center studies with thousands of patients, they looked at, they put them in groups, surgery versus no surgery, and they looked at the outcomes at one, two years down the road. Bottom line is if you have a herniated disc and spinal stenosis and you have moderate to severe pain, you have significant loss in function. So in other words, if you have mild pain and you can function, you don't have to do things. Or if you have moderate to severe nerve damage, if your leg's completely numb, if your leg can't walk, you're falling, your leg's buckling, uh, basically, if you don't want to have surgery, you could try all the other stuff we talked about for six weeks. But if you're not better by six weeks, you're probably not going to get better. So that's the time to do surgery for a herniated disc or spinal stenosis. Six weeks. That's a reasonable amount of time. The balance between the risks of surgery and, and the chance that you're going to get better. So let's say, all right, I don't want to do surgery at six weeks. Then if you want to try injections or other things, fine. But then you got between six weeks, six weeks and six months. If you're not better by six months, that nerve is going to be permanent. So these people that wait 10 years, a lot of times they, they, they do poorly with surgery. And then what happens is I operate on a hurt people. Not, the 90 who do what I tell them to do, do great. And they have no pain. So you know what they do? They tell five people they had surgery. And they don't think about it. They go back to work. They forgot about it. The 10% of people who don't do well, either because they waited too long or the nerve damage was just permanent from the beginning, or they don't do what I asked them to do. Those 10 people that do poorly with surgery, they will tell 10,000 people. They'll post bad reviews on the internet, they'll trash you to all your friends, and they'll tell everybody that they know, don't have spine surgery. That, so, that, so that's what they call, in, in evidence-based medicine, that's what we call a reporting bias, which is why I tell people, that's why you need to go see a professional. I spent 14 years doing this. I've been doing this for 24 years. I've seen, I, I see about 5,000 patients a year. I do about 200 spine surgeries a year. I've done about 8,000 spine surgeries. I know who, when surgery is necessary. And a lot of people don't trust doctors. And yes, there are some doctors are out there who just want to make money. But that's not me. And that's not our group. And that's not my partners. I have plenty of stuff to do. Plenty of people to operate on without doing unnecessary stuff. But that's what the story is. And that's why you shouldn't listen to, when, when people try to give you advice about surgery, ask, is my problem your problem? They may, they may have psychological problems. They may have surgery that wasn't done properly. They may not have needed surgery. So you got to really talk to your doctor. And, if, and if, you, if you're concerned, you don't trust the doctor, fine, go to another qualified spine specialist, an orthopedic spine surgeon, neurosurgeon, it doesn't make a difference between orthopedic and neurosurgeons. They, it's more the skill of the surgeon than the specialty. But, but don't let your friends and family tell you whether you have surgery or not. I've seen disasters, people having horrible outcomes because they listen to their family and friends. And then you finally operate on them, but they'd never recover. So next slide. Now, spondylolisthesis. When do you do surgery in spondylolisthesis? That's the thing with the slip bone. Normally, because that's a bigger surgery and you've got to put rods and screws in, most people say six months, as long as you don't have nerve damage. If you have nerve damage, six weeks or right away, if it rapidly progresses. But let's say you just have back pain and pain comes and goes in your legs. You try six months, brace, physical therapy, injections. But if, if you have severe disabling symptoms or if the bone slips forward more, like sometimes if there's a crack here, it'll slip forward more then you gotta do surgery. And surgery is not, you don't wanna take out the disc because that's gonna make it worse. You actually have to go and fuse the spine, put rods and screws in. And believe it or not, that's the best indication for, for fusion. You know, you hear things about spinal fusion. About 90% of people are proven to have a good result with this type of surgery for this problem because it's mechanical instability. Now, what do we do with people with degenerative discs? They have multiple bulging discs, they have back, neck or back pain with arm and leg pain. In the 1980s and 90s, we were fusing everybody. We were doing three, four-level fusions. And we found that 
a lot of times people just didn't do well. You know, they had they had just as much pain after surgery. So we normally are away, we're getting away from fusing people for back and arm pain. We usually just try to tell them to live with it. Now, you may find a good patient. Some there are some patients that spinal fusion is a great operation. If they have only one or two bad discs, the rest of the discs are normal and they don't have any a lot, a lot of times what determines bad results from fusion for back pain, if people have, if people, the, the biggest risk factor for bad outcome from spinal fusion surgery is an unhappy childhood. So people that have unhappy childhoods, people that have depression, anxiety, a lot of times they have coping skill problems. And those people just don't, the, the amount of pain that normal people can deal with, they can't deal with. So when you go and put rods and screws in the back of somebody like this, they just don't do well. So we rarely do surgery for, for, uh, back pain or arm pain without nerve pain. Uh, so, and because the results are so unpredictable and many insurers won't even cover it, e even if you fail physical therapy. But in rare cases, if you have one or bad, two bad discs, you can either do a disc replacement or a fusion. But we don't do, we don't even think about it for six months. So for the most part, we don't do surgery for neck or back pain alone. So I'm gonna end the talk now and then I'll have some time for questions. So in summary, 90% of back problems are due to degenerative conditions. 10% are due to fractures, tumors, infections, deformity. Oh, I'm sorry, my hand rings so bad, but all the other stuff. So most of the time, your condition is due to something that's genetic and can be treated non-surgically. 70% genetic, 80% are improved to two to six weeks, and surgeries are indicated emergently only for severe instability or this, or if you have failed conservative treatment of six weeks, that's when you should do surgery. So I'm going to end the talk now, and then I'm going to open it up for, um, for uh, let me see here, questions. And please bear, please forgive me. This is, I'm new at this. So let's, I'm going to do some questions. Oh, oh so I, I got some questions now. So one question is, does laser help torn rotator cuffs? Uh, the, the answer is it can help rotator cuffs, but if the rotator cuff's completely torn, usually you have to do an arthroscopic repair with anchors. So if it's a partially torn rotator cuff, we've had success with that. Um, the next question is, what is the difference between a bulging disc and herniated disc? If you remember, if, if you remember from the talk, a bulging disc is a tire without enough air, and then a herniated disc is where that tire gets a little tear in it, and a piece comes out, out and hits the nerve. So a bulging disc is like is a tire without enough air, and a herniated disc is where that tire that's bulging without enough air blows out in one spot. Um, okay. Uh, I have another question, is neuropathy both legs caused by back problems? Uh, well, neuropathy, the way we think about it is, neuropathy means um, nerve disease. Most time when doctors use the term neuropathy, it means there's a problem with the nerves themselves. Now, now so usually when you have a, a back problem, it's called radiculopathy when the nerve roots compress. So neuropathy is usually a problem with either the nerves themselves usually from diabetes or a vitamin problem or alcohol. People who drink a lot of alcohol get nerve problems. And, um, and sometimes there's some rare genetic conditions, autoimmune conditions. So neuropathy is usually not caused by back problems. It's neuropathy itself, but if you have pain in your legs, and usually neuropathy is you have numbness in your hands and feet, it's usually not that painful. If you have severe pain radiating down, then you gotta rule out a pinched nerve. And some people can have both a problem with the nerves, neuropathy, and, and radiculopathy or a back problem. Is there treatment for kyphosis? Um, the answer is if you're a teenager and you have Sharma's kyphosis and the spine is growing, we'll put people in a brace to try to straighten out the spine. If that doesn't work, then sometimes you have to put screws and rods in and straighten the back out. If you're an adult with kyphosis, normally we treat it, you could try therapy and braces, but they don't work much. And if the kyphosis is bad enough, sometimes you have to really do a big surgery. You have to go in and put rods and screws the whole way up and down. And we literally have, to, sometimes we have to cut the spine around the spinal cord and straighten the spine up. So it's a pretty big surgery. And unfortunately, a lot of the people that have kyphosis are older. They have a lot of arthritis in the spine. They have a lot of medical problems. They have a lot of osteoporosis. So if you have osteoporosis, the rods and screws don't hold. So usually in older people, unless it's really bad, most of that's treated non-surgically. Is there any significance to hemangiomas of the spine? In general, the answer is usually not. Um, unless the hemangioma is actually expanding the bone or causing the bone to fracture, we see them all the time. And I think of people as, you know, some people have birthmarks like port wine stains. And, and, and basically, sometimes they're very common in the spine. And they usually have a classic appearance on the MRI that if you get an MRI, the radiologist can tell right away it's benign. Sometimes there are atypical hemangiomas that you have to watch and maybe repeat an MRI several months later. 
So in general, hemangiomas are not the cause of back pain. Um, next one, can spinal stenosis cause issue with bowel and bladder movements? Yes, if the spinal stenosis is severe enough, you can either get incontinence where you're peeing yourself and you don't realize it, and that's to differentiate stress incontinence, which happens in women when they cough or sneeze. If, you, if, you, if urine leaks out when you cough or sneeze, that's not coming from your back. This is coming from a, a stretched out bladder wall. Um, and, and bowel movements, but if you, if you suddenly have back pain, and usually if you're having bowel and bladder problems, but you don't have back pain, it's not related to spinal stenosis. If it's bad enough to cause uh, bowel and bladder problems, then you, you know, you're, you're gonna have severe back pain and probably leg pain too. But if you, if you get, you're losing control of your bowels and bladder and they're just pouring out and you can't walk, you have back pain, then you've gotta, you gotta go call 911, go to the emergency room. Uh, sometimes you can get urinary retention where you can't pee. Yeah, and that, it, that, once again, that's associated with back pain. If you have it without back pain, it's something else. Uh, so let's see the uh, next one here. Does alcohol use aggravate DVD? No, but it probably helps the pain. No, I'm just kidding. No, no, it doesn't. Alcohol doesn't aggravate uh, DDD, but it can. If you drink alcohol regularly or heavily, it can cause neuropathy. Um, let's see. Benefits of sacral act fusion over ablation. Well, ablation is very hard to ablate the sacral act joint because it, it really, it's, it's hard to get all the nerves there. So if you don't want surgery, fine, you can try ablation. But uh, SI fusion has, ablation has about a 60% success rate. SI fusion, which we do through minimally invasive techniques, and I'll, I'll get a book. I have some um, sacroiliac fusion. We have these implants called SI bone, and they're done through a little incision about this big. And they're for people that have sacroiliac pain for more than six months. So the SI fusion, in my experience, is about 90% successful. It's usually about a one hour surgery. Um, there are some risks with it, but the couple of criteria is pretty low, about one to 5% and um, recovery time is about six weeks. So that's the benefit of sacral effusion. How would you treat numbness in the pinky finger? Well, it depends on what's causing the numbness in the pinky finger. A lot of times that's due to compression of the ulnar nerve here. So the doctor could do a test. If you get pain that's worse in your pinky when you go that and you're sensitive over there, it's like you hit your funny bone, then the numbness in the pinky finger could be like that. And sometimes we use a brace or a medicine called gabapentin for nerve pain. If that doesn't work and the arm's getting worse, you can just release the nerve. Sometimes if it's coming from the neck, you have to do, if it's a pitched nerve in the neck, you have to do a surgery for that. Let's see, sciatica treated with gabapentin for 300 times a day, helped have diabetes. Do you need to be concerned if it feels better? No, it's good that it feels better. Uh, sometimes it means the nerve is getting better on its own or the disc is melting away. Um, another question, um, what if you have spinal stenosis in the lumbar region with neurogenic claudication and problems with bowel movements? You've been trying with that. Once again, if it's severe spinal stenosis, you know, you prob probably have surgery. Uh, I would see a GI doctor first, but sometimes you can get, if, also if you're on pain medicine, if you're on opioid pain medicine like oxycodone, that can cause problems with bowel movements. So you probably should have an MRI and, and see, you know, if there's severe pinching, that would be a reason to do surgery. How long can someone take gabapentin? Um, really, there's no duration on it. I literally have had patients that have been on gabapentin for 15, 20 years. I've been prescribing it. And while there's always potential side effects, it doesn't seem to cause any cumulative damage to the heart, liver, or anything else. So I've had people on it for years, and they have not seen problems. Um, let's see. Another one, if you have an ablation and now cannot move your bowels. Um, yeah, you know, that's not a good sign. I think, um, you know, if it's something that's persisting for more than a few days, you know, that's something you got to call your doctor and get seen for right away. Usually that's not a normal sign, a side effect of uh, ablation. And then somebody here is, what's your office phone? Um, if you go to our website, it's uh, orthoadc.com, Orthopedic Associates of Dutchess County. It's uh, 454-0120. Is there any relationship between compression fractures and rib pain? I had a, suffered a compression fracture in January yeah. And I'm still um, have am in quite a bit of pain. Sure, um, I, I I have a lot of experience with that. So the answer is, sometimes when you get a compression fracture, the disc or the bone can pinch the nerve that comes out of the hole where the fracture is. Yeah. And then that can pinch the nerve, the thoracic nerve, and that can cause pain radiating around the ribs. So if you're still having pain, it might be worth it to get an MRI to see if the nerve's pinched there. And if it is, you could try an epidural injection. But if the spinal cord is pinched there, the nerve is severely pinched and it doesn't get better after a, a few months, you might have to have a surgery to relieve that pressure. 
called a laminectomy. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see, I have another one question. Can one take Advil and Mobic on different days? The answer is yes. You shouldn't take them on the same day. Mobic is a once a day medication. It's designed to last all day. And what Mobic is, is it's, it's a, what's called a COX-2 selective inhibitor. So there's two enzymes. There's COX-1 that stands for cyclooxygenase and there's COX-2. And COX-1 is the stuff that preserves the stomach lining. So in theory, it attacks less of the um, stomach lining than the other medications. Can L5S1 degenerative disc cause pelvic ache? Yes, sometimes it can refer pain in the pelvis, yes. Um, almost complete nerve compression at 5.1, eight to 12 spinal injections suggested, no suggests. Would it be good to try let, or get let? Yes, you should. I, my goal is, I, I tell people, if you don't get better with two injections, you're only gonna make things worse because after you have that many injections, the nerve sac gets worn away. And sometimes when you do surgery, you get a spinal fluid leak or an infection. So I tell people, if you've had that many injections, you're not better Then you probably think about nerve sur surgery, especially if you have, um, especially if you have uh, problems. And if it's bilateral, we clean out both sides. Uh, let's see, you've had a laminectomy, injections, epidural ablations. Is there anything else, or I've run out of options? Um, well, I think my, in my fellowship, I trained with a guy named Arthur White. He was president of the North American Spine Society. And we specialized in my fellowship, we, we dealt with people that had failed back surgery. So probably about half the back surgeries we did were revisions. Now, why does surgery fail? One is the nerve damage could be bad. Two is sometimes I see people when the surgeons, you know, do the laminectomy, they're afraid to make the spine unstable. So sometimes they, some of the bone gets left there. They, they think the nerves decompressed, but it really isn't. So some people have what's called residual spinal stenosis. Another reason is sometimes after you do a laminectomy, the spine starts shifting and gets unstable. Sometimes you could have, they could, you could have a laminectomy and some surgeons say, well, I wanna make the surgery small, so I'll just do the worst level and hopefully that'll help. So some people get the condition that can spread to other levels. So, so you really what should do is if, if you tried everything, you should maybe get a second opinion from a different surgeon, have them look at everything, MRIs, and sometimes they're treatable causes. But if, um, if everything else hasn't failed, you might want to do a spinal cord stimulator trial. All right, so I think, I, I think I've answered all the questions that everybody's had. Um, so if there's, um, I'm going to end the webinar now. But certainly, if you have any specific questions, the best thing to do is to schedule a consultation with myself or one of my partners. And basically, we are doing some telemedicine still if somebody's afraid to come out of the house. You just have to have a working computer. And hopefully if you're able to watch this webinar, you do. So if you're really afraid or you're sick or you've been told not to leave the house, we, we do have telemedicine available too. And so I'll end it and I'll thank you all for your time and attention. And um, you know, I, I've really dedicated my life to the treatment of spinal mission. I'm very passionate about it. I, you know, it's, it's really been exciting to see how far we've come since I was a resident when there wasn't much we could do for people, but there's a lot of cool stuff that we can do now. Uh, both surgical and non-surgical. And uh, thank you and good night.